Uh, without further ado, uh, welcome everybody. Yeah, I think most people are here now, so many thanks for joining us today. As you know, we put this series together of uh, expert sessions during lockdown, uh, which, and we hope they've been helpful for you, and we really hope you enjoyed today's session. Um, huge thanks to Ordnance Survey for um, coming along, and I shall introduce our speaker, uh, Tim, very shortly. Um, uh, just in case you weren't aware, this is the final session, uh, so please, uh, so you really got an opportunity to pick, uh, you know, the brains of our, our speaker this morning, ask lots of questions, and uh, really make sure it's it's helpful for you. Uh, so what we'll do is we we'll move on to our uh, uh, etiquette slide. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar now with some of the uh, these aspects. Uh, um, we will be using the annotation, so just a quick reminder for those who uh, may have forgotten, if you go to the top of the screen, next to uh, the green bar is the view options, click on that, scroll down to annotate, that's where you'll find the annotations, whether it's a stamp, and I'm just going to put a heart on next to today's session, um, so hopefully uh, that will be straightforward when we do those. Um, I'll just clear the clear off the heart. Um, we'll also be asking you to engage in the chat, which you should find at the bottom. Uh, so please do so to respond to some questions. And uh, that's more than enough for me. So I'd like to introduce Tim Newman from Ordnance Survey. I will let him uh, say more about himself and enjoy this morning's session. Over to you, Tim. Many thanks. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm Tim Newman. Uh, I work for Ordnance Survey as a digital product manager um, in the leisure side of the business. Um, and before that, I've kind of done a number of roles there, part of it in the public sector team. Um, I was an open data product manager before and um, before that um, did some work in sort of the data side, um, data engineering. So I've kind of worked, worked around the business um, a bit, but now um, firmly planted in the, in the leisure team with my kind of main responsibility for um, OS Maps. I think my, my kind of first interaction with the world of OS probably came a few decades before um, when I discovered um, a site called, I think it was Map Zone, and um, it was a kind of thing to, to make maps fun for kids, and um, I quite enjoyed that as a, as a young kid. And I also discovered I don't think that many other kids um, <laughs> were particularly interested in maps either, so I could pretty much enter every competition they ran and uh, and guarantee winning a prize so i probably have more um os stash by the age of 10 than i than i do now actually working for for us but anyway so I've, yeah been uh, been at us now for six years um i'm conscious um with the audience that you probably are very clued up on um on all things um maps and ordnance survey so um, i'm going to try to avoid sort of map reading for, <laughs> for beginners type thing um, and I thought I'd look a little bit at um, kind of past, present and, and future of, of OS. Um, so hopefully there's, there's something there that kind of everyone will find um, new um, and interesting. Uh, questions wise, please feel free to um, pop something in the chat. If I don't spot it, then, um, then I'm sure someone will interrupt me. If not, we'll, there'll be plenty of time at the end for that. Um, so if you've got um, burning questions on OS or digital navigation, then um, we'll, we'll have more than enough time to kind of go through all of those. Um, to start with, I thought um, just to kind of gauge the, um, the pitch of this, I do a quick quiz to assess your uh, your knowledge of OS, and then I can try and um, kind of pitch what I'm what, what I'm saying to the audience. So um, there are going to be four questions, um, nice simple quiz, and uh, without further ado, let's go to it. So question one, um, you can pr probably just like note note down the answers either on a scrap of paper or in, in your head, um, and then we'll go through um, go through the answers in, in one go. So. Question one, uh, starting easy, what colour is an explorer map? That's easy one to start. Um, question two, um, <laughs> what is the difference between these two types of trees on the right, taken from a, a 25k uh, map? And question three, 
uh, starting to get a bit harder now to the nearest 100 years. Uh, how old is Ordnance Survey officially? And finally, now sorting uh, <laughs> the week from the chaff here. Um, question four, heights on OS maps are shown above mean sea level, but where was that mean sea level measured? I'm looking for a, a place name. Cool. Um, so you should have four answers now. Um, what we're going to do is go through those and you will get, uh, give yourself uh, one point for a correct answer on question one, two points for a correct answer on question two, three points for question three, four points for question four, and then you'll have a score out of 10. Um, and, and you can put yourself on the scale from, from zero to full on uh, OS anorak. Um, just to say there's absolutely nothing wrong with either of those ends of the spectrum. Um, I'm, I'm expecting lots of high scores. So um, if you want to pop your, your score in the comments, um, and I'll try and work out how to view the comments, um, or even uh, if you can uh, scribble an annotation on the slide, if you know how to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, the color of an Explorer map is, of course, orange. Um, the clue was in the t-shirt I am wearing. <laughs> the, um, the two types of trees are um, Coniferous and non-coniferous. Then uh, question three, uh, to the nearest 100 years, um, so the answer I was looking for is 200 years. Um, so it was uh, 1791 is the kind of official, uh, official start date of, of OS. And uh, the, the final question four was, um, height are measured uh, from Newlyn in Cornwall, a uh, little town of, of Newlyn on the south coast of Cornwall. So, um, Looks like you guys have got the, the measure of the, the scheme. Yeah, so circle or tick or whatever on, on the thing below. So that's, yeah, one point for question one, two, two, three, three, and four for question four. <laughs> cool. Um, so it looks like uh, an average score of six. I presume um, that was because the, the fourth question was the uh, the, the decider really. Um, so I think I take from that pretty solid, uh, pretty solid knowledge of OS. I'll try to avoid the the basics and we'll um, kind of keep it at, at that level. So um, moving on. Oh, magic. So um, a little bit of kind of history to start with. Um, as I mentioned, um, the official start of OS was um, 1791, but the kind of the foundations of it were, were laid a little bit earlier, really, when um, in the middle of the 18th century, the uh, Jacobite rebellion was happening in, in Scotland and um, the government of England kind of realised they hadn't really got a clue where all of these people were, were hiding. They uh, the kind of vast tracts of Scotland which were which were pretty much unknown um, and there was no kind of single decent map for that so um, the the mapping of Scotland was was started sort of in the, in the mid um, 18th century and um, before kind of OS was a, officially a, a thing um, and this was kind of a, a military endeavor but the the kind of the personnel and the techniques were um, were starting to sort of pave the way for uh, the, the full start of OS so that kind of happened then um, and then the next stage was um, a little bit more of a, an international um, slant to it. So the, um, the French actually came and approached um, the Royal Society and said, there's this discrepancy between um, the, uh, the, the Paris Observatory and, and what you've got in Greenwich. And we're not quite sure exactly where they are relatively. Um, and so it would be great to, um, to kind of construct a, um, a series of triangulations between the two to, to understand um, where they actually are. So in order to do that, um, this is the, um, the kind of the theory of triangulation, which I'm sure you guys have sort of probably heard of, um, maybe even kind of know the, the details of, but essentially you, um, you measure along baseline um, and then you've got two points and you know how far apart they are. Um, and then you go to a third point and you, and you measure the angle between those two points. Um, and then you've created a, a triangle um, and because you know how far those two points are apart and you know what those angles are, you've then kind of precisely identified where the third point is. Um, and then you can kind of continue that and, and slowly spread out. So the, um, the original baseline used was on, on Hounslow Heath. Um, I think I've got a picture on the next slide. So it was, it was about five miles long 
Um, as you can see now, it is um, very much built over and, and finishes in, in Heathrow Airport. So um, you, you can't kind of, <laughs> you can't walk it anymore. You'd probably get arrested as you try to climb over the, the runway. But um, those were the original two points that we used. Um, and then angles were taken from that, extended all the way to, um, to Paris. Um, and then later, um, once they sort of settled this um, dispute about the, the relative positions of, of Paris and, and Greenwich, exactly the same baseline was used to start the triangulation of, of the whole country. So um, just from two, two single points, um, a, ba a baseline measured extremely precisely, like it's, um, it's amazing since we've been able to kind of verify these things with modern GPS, these guys were just using um, foot, uh, 18 foot long glass um, rods. They started with wood, um, but the wood sort of, when it got a bit damp, it expanded um, and it, it wasn't precise enough. So they, they swapped for glass. And so they were literally placing an 18 foot glass rod um, and then another one and, and measuring how many of those it took to get between these two points. And they, they did that for five miles over Hounslow Heath and established these two points, which were then used for the rest of the country in this process of, of triangulation. Um, so the, the kind of the, the bit about triangulation most people are, are familiar with are um, triangulation pillars or, or trig points, and those were um, essentially a, a fairly modern um, in, in the history of OS um, in, invention. So originally, when they did it, they just um, they set up on similar places, so you know the tops of hills, places with a, with a good view, um, but they didn't actually generally put a permanent structure in place to kind of mark where um, where that was. So. As you can imagine, kind of down the line, um, it became harder to uh, to sort of base new measurements off that because they sort of lost track of, of where exactly they they based the original measurements off. So they might go to the top of a hill, um, and they might bury something under the ground or try and make a, a cairn, a pile of stones. Um, but there was nothing as permanent um, as the the concrete trig point. So when in the 20th century um, they decided it was time you know instrumentation had improved and it was time to do a re-triangulation um, as in do the whole process again they used the same um, baseline and same principles but they um, at these main st trig stations they, they built a concrete pillar so there was a, a kind of a permanent reminder of this is where we did the measurements from and there's no kind of ambiguity then. So those are obviously are now, are now dotted across the country um, generally at, at high points with, with good views. And, and it means that we know where that point is on the map and we're also 100% sure where it is on the ground because we've built a, <laughs> built a massive pillar there. Now, none of those are obviously um, used, used these days. Um, everything is mapped by, um, by, by GPS. So, um, we have we have GPSs, we have um, aerial surveys, so planes will kind of fly over the country, um, and probably at some point soon it may even um, start using satellite data, which um, is kind of getting better and better in, in terms of resolution. But um, the the trig pillars remain, and obviously they're always a, a welcome sight on a misty uh, misty crag when you're trying to uh, be sure where you are. So um, the I think what you could call the sort of start of the leisure business. I mentioned at the start, I'm, I'm part of the leisure side of OS. Um, that's to distinguish it from um, a pretty big um, business to business um, part and a business to government. So um, we are still a, um, a government organisation. So we're, we're a limited company owned by, by government. Um, and, you know, the, by um, some sort of size of, of teams, um, the consumer, the leisure part is, is actually quite small. Um, even though it's probably the part most people are familiar with. Um, we're doing a huge amount of stuff with government. We've recently um, signed a new 10-year um, agreement with, with them and we're, we're helping provide mapping data for all um, local authorities, for the police, fire, ambulance service, central government. Um, so there's a huge amount of um, it, it, location data really. So um, although people associate all that's over with maps, um, really it's a, it's a data company. Um, we've got a um, our kind of core database with about half a, a billion records in it um, and those make data products which go into to government organisations and businesses um, and to help them you know, make better decisions basically. Um, the consumer side of the business a little bit smaller in numbers but uh, in terms of um, reach um, probably possibly kind of bigger and I think you can probably um, make a reasonable argument for um, 1919 being the date that the, the consumer part of OS really started. So um, we've gone to all this effort of 
collecting all this data. Um, it, was a, it was a huge, huge process, as you, as you can imagine. So the, the, the picture, just looking back there, that picture on the right is the, the Ramsden theodolite. Um, and this kind of great theodolite was used um, to make all of those initial measurements. And, and it was um, about, I think it's about 90 kilograms worth of weight, which they had to kind of lug up um, mountains. They built a kind of um, protected structure around it. So a huge undertaking to kind of work their way through um, through Great Britain mapping it um, and, and even sort of um, pause halfway because they went to start mapping Ireland as well. So massive undertaking to collect all that data. Um, and then after the First World War, um, a guy called um, Charles Close, who was the Director General um, of OS at the time, realised that actually, you know, this data and these maps are, um, they're very important for military purposes and, and OS at that point was still a military organisation but um, they're also extremely valuable for people who just want to go out for a walk, or go for a cycle, enjoy the outdoors basically. So um, he commissioned these um, new map covers to kind of make uh, maps more appealing to a general audience. And, and that was in, in 1919 um, when that happened. Um, and so you could probably sort of make an argument for that was the start of when OS tried to uh, appeal to a, a leisure market and to um, to encourage people to, to get outside and, uh, and go for walk cycles and, and just enjoy the outdoors. Um, I'm <laughs> not quite sure why I put that, put that slide in. I think this is probably one of the original, in original maps. Um, the, I think an interesting point to note here is they um, kind of it shows a little bit of the evolution of how these maps were made. You'll notice the kind of, they do include contours here, but they still include these hachures, which are the um, kind of triangular wedges to denote the, um, the relief of a map. So those were used on the original maps um, and were basically drawn, drawn by hand. Um, they were tended to be kind of one of the hardest parts of, of making these maps. So really it is, um, although we sort of talk about OS as a, as a data company, um, there's definitely a degree of, of art that went into it, certainly in those early days when um, the people creating these things were real craftsmen. Um, I think the, um, as you kind of track through the, the, the history of OS, the, um, there are three things I think which kind of underpin um, everything we, we do um, from a kind of a digital um, navigation point of view. Um, and I think this starts all the way back in, in 1919 when, when you could say the leisure business started. So um, it's, it's data, it's having collected all of that geographic data um, and wanting to do something with it. There's technology which kind of underpins um, how you use it. Um, and then there's obviously, there's user need, which is um, really how we, um, so, you know, we're encouraging people to get out, out, outside more often. So the data had already been gathered um, in 1919. Technology was um, pretty much, um, it had been around for a while. It was printing and being able to kind of print maps um, in, in, in mass. And, um, and the user need was, was helping people to get outside. And, and since then, really, it's just been variations on, on those three things. Um, and I think you can kind of, you can illustrate that not quite nicely um, with, the, uh, with the Wainwright books. These are, I'm sure, are familiar to lots of you. I keep one on, on my desk as a sort of reminder of what um, I think fantastic design looks like. And if, um, if we can get, get near that with our digital products, then I'm, I'm happy. Um, but I think Wainwright kind of captured what people's um, user needs were. And, um, he, he understood that people wanted more than just a, a map. You know, some people, um, that's all they want, that's all they need. They look at a map and they can picture a landscape in 3D um, and that's all, um, all the input they need to kind of help plan a, a walk or something. But I think Wayne Wright realised, actually some people want um, you know, different ways to interact with that. They, they might want to see it in 3D, for example. So he drew his, his kind of 3D um, versions of the maps. And... Um, the user need was is, is exactly the same then as it is is now um but technology has changed and it was only kind of a few years ago really that the technology um we, we found in the gaming industry allowed us to kind of recreate um that 3d experience so um you, as you can imagine you know the the technology that underpins computer games is is really optimized for for viewing things in 3d um, and we found we could use that same technology um, to add a feature into our maps, which uses aerial imagery, it uses a height model, 
um, and it creates a kind of really realistic view um, of, of the mountain in 3D. So this is exactly the same user need. We're just trying to help people who, um, who might struggle to look at a, uh, a blank, uh, a flat paper map and, and understand all its nuances. Um, just give them a new way to visualize the route they're doing. And, um, you know, see whether it's going to be um, really hard work or if it's going to go up a knife edge ridge, which might, you know, be a bit too, um, too much of an undertaking if they're, they're not got a good head for heights. So exactly the same user need. Um, the data is the same really, but um, technology kind of advanced to allow us to now do that anywhere in the country. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the areas we find this quite um, useful or, or the feedback we've had is um, for people leading groups, um, the, the groups themselves might not necessarily um, understand the map as, as well as the leader, obviously, um, but you still want to kind of give them a good idea of what they're about to let themselves in for over the day. because. Um, so there's sort of no nasty surprises <laughs> towards the end of the day when there's a, a big final climb, that kind of thing. So um, the 3D mode is a really nice way of, um, of letting people um, have a preview of what they're doing without them necessarily having to, to understand how to interpret contours on a map and that kind of thing. Um, exactly the same sort of story with um, augmented reality. So the, the user need in this scenario is um, you've just got to the top of a, a mountain, it's a clear day and you're looking around on the horizon um, and if you're not necessarily familiar with the area, you might not really know what you're looking at. So um, Wainwright, um, back in 1951, um, when these guides came out, his solution to that was to, to draw it out. Um, so you could, if you had your book with you, um, you went to the top of your Wainwright cell, um, you could look and, and work out exactly what you're, what you're seeing on the horizon. Um, and again, the sort of the technology to do that digitally um, uh, wasn't really there um, until um, really fairly recently. So back in 2006, um, the technology was slowly starting to catch up. We had the data at this point, we understood the user need, but the technology wasn't quite there. So this um, is the first prototype we did of um, augmented reality. Now, I'm sure you're, you're all aware of, of augmented reality now, you can get it on, on most sort of smartphones, um, but just sort of over 10 years ago, it wasn't a thing at all. Um, and Ordnance are actually kind of one of the pioneers of it. Um, so this is what you're looking at there is a, a kind of an old laptop um, with a GPS and a camera kind of gaffer taped to it. Um, and it performed exactly the same functions as AR on a phone, but um, it weighed a couple of kilograms and it's not the sort of thing you'd kind of carry around with you on a, on a walk. Um, so technology not quite there, um, but we sort of, we, we had the user need at the back of our minds so that when finally, you know, a few years ago now, um, the technology to make I AR work um, finally became available on kind of everyday handsets. It meant we could, could implement something um, to, to meet that original use case of you get to the top of a mountain, um, you don't necessarily want to, it, it could be windy or you just don't have um, the time to spread out a paper map and take bearings or, or whatever to work out what you're looking at. Um, you, can, you can hold your phone up and um, see the, the mountains or the, the lakes uh, or the towns or whatever you're looking at labelled using uh, augmented reality. So um, just another example of um, technology uh, moving, the user need kind of staying the same, we've known about it, but we're just addressing it in, in different ways. Um, and, and another kind of quick example of uh, similar to the first one, a 3D map, you know, previously you probably have, um, you've, you've seen these kind of 3D uh, views often of, of national parks or whatever, you, you, can, you can buy them, put them on the wall. Um, until augmented reality on phones, um, it was quite an undertaking to make a 3D model um, to have on your coffee table. Um, with augmented reality, you can instantly create one of those um, for any route in, in the country, put it on, on your coffee table and, and kind of and have a look at it. You just hold your phone up and, and, and zoom in and out. Um, it looks sort of something like this. So exactly the same user need, just technology catching up and allowing us to, to address it. Um, and then I think just a few other examples of where um, I think we see the user need of, of kind of helping people to get outside um, more often. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a map. I think um, what we try and do is um, be guided by that, that underlying purpose of helping people get outside. Um, and we'll, um, if, it, if it's a map they need, that's great, we can spun with a map. But we're also kind of looking at new ways to, to help people who might be put off by maps, uh, who might have a fear of the outdoors, um, or just sort of need people um, need some input to kind of help them get ideas and, and organize those ideas. So um, 
as well as OS Max, we've got a, a range of new um, new apps coming out. So the, the one uh, on the left there is called uh, Get Outside. This is a kind of partner app for the Get Outside campaign, which is um, something we've been running for a few years where um, we have a website, we have some Get Outside champions. It's a sort of, it's an initiative basically to, um, to help us um, further our, our aim of helping more people get outside more often. Um, and it's specifically designed to kind of bridge that gap um, because there are so many people for who, who, who aren't you know, going to go and buy a paper map or get an OS Maps um, subscription. Um, and, and we're sort of trying to bridge that gap to en enable more and more people to, to enjoy the, uh, the benefits of being out, outside. So get outside um, provides ideas, um, generally sort of geared towards families, but kind of can work for anyone. Ideas of places to go, events that are on, um, or as well as sort of suggesting uh, nice places, it might suggest things to do at those places. So instead of just saying, um, you know, why don't you uh, go to the beach? It might say, why don't you go to the beach and here are some suggested activities to do at the beach. So just all about feeding you um, ideas of, of things to do. The next one along uh, Secret Stories is, is kind of in a uh, testing phase at the moment. So you can, you can get it off the App Store, but we're, um, we're slowly rolling out more content. So there's some stuff in Bournemouth and, and Salisbury at the moment and we'll be slowly um, adding more stuff. Um, this is just about making um, new, um, you know, interesting content behind a walk. So it, it's more, more than a walk. We offer um, kind of interesting historical tales. Um, some, uh, you know, so, some people don't need that to get out. They'll just enjoy a walk for the sake of walk. Some people want a little bit more kind of info and purpose and knowledge. And so we are um, we're using Secret Stories as a way of giving people um, that. So it will take you through a series of kind of, um, of stories, um, you know, maybe explain some part of history or um, an interesting feature. So the one in Bournemouth is um, about interesting trees. The one in Salisbury is more kind of history orientated. And we're looking to kind of um, to, to partner with people who have um, interesting stories to tell um, and, and make that available to as many people as possible, just as an, another way of kind of um, encouraging a, a different audience to uh, to get outside and enjoy the outdoors, an, an audience we wouldn't kind of necessarily um, otherwise reach. Um, so as a sort of kind of a, a summary slide of those, those three main areas, um, the user need, I think you can see along the bottom, is, is kind of constant. We're, um, we're all about helping more people to get outside more often um, and we'll do a, a number of different products and, and you know, ideas to achieve that. Um, but that kind of fundamental um, thing doesn't change. Um, the technology, as you can see, um, does and it is changing kind of rapidly. So for about 100 years, roughly, it was it was all about paper maps, um, and that was the only way we kind of um, we went around uh, went about this. Um, and, and obviously, paper maps are still kind of a, a massive part of, of what we do. Um, so these kind of things to the right of those haven't replaced paper maps. It's just um, in, in addition to. Um, then kind of handheld GPSs came along, um, initially very basic, um, starting to kind of get more and more advanced, but at the same time the, the GPS functionality in phones was also getting a lot better. Um, and so I think it's probably, you know, the, the, apart from a few slightly more niche use cases, um, for most people um, using a, a phone is, is good enough because it can do pretty much everything a GPS can do um, and more. And then I think kind of looking, looking further forward, um, we'll start seeing far more use of, of wearables, so um, things like smartwatches um, or even um, kind of glasses and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's not um, beyond the realms of imagination to, to kind of see in, in 10 years' time, people will have these smart glasses. Um, they'll use them for, for navigation around um, cities and that kind of thing, but equally they could be used for navigation around um, you know, mountain landscapes and, um, and see the, the path they're meant to be following. Um, a bit like the augmented reality mode I showed earlier, it could kind of highlight the interesting bits, um, show what, what peaks you're looking at and that kind of thing. So technology uh, moving really fast. Data-wise, um, I think uh, the kind of the biggest changes we've seen um, kind of around the 1990s, we, we finished digitizing all of our paper maps. So it was you know, paper for a couple of centuries. Um, digitized now, what you can see in the middle there is our server room. So that's that's what a computer with half a billion uh, data points looks like. Um, but then I think, you know, it won't be long before um, everything will be cloud-based as well. So um, the, the data is just getting a lot bigger. Um, obviously, on a, on a paper map, you are, you're limited in how much you can store by the size of the paper. 
Um, and that's really a fundamental change. So um, the, the 25K map um, crams an enormous amount of information into a, a fairly small amount of space. And, it, and it's done um, by kind of really well-trained cartographers who, uh, who know exactly how to place labels in the, in the right way to make the maps as clear as possible, but still containing all that information. Um, but you know, in, in the future, we're not limited by a piece of paper in, in terms of how much um, we can we can show. So um, there'll be far more data gathered. Some of it by surveyors, some of it aerial, some of it um, supplied by by users. You know, but when you've got um, you know, thousands of people out using the app, um, they're also if, you know they they can supply interesting information to share it with other users. So there's um, there's going to be a huge amount more data which people can use and. Um, and then we can decide or the user can decide what's relevant to them. So, um, you know, if you're not at all interested in seeing um, county boundaries, which you see on the 25K map, you don't need to see those um, county boundaries. If you, if you are really interested in history, then we can show you more historic stuff. If, you, if you're driving a car, we can show you more places to park. So um, there'll be far, far more data um, because we won't have to deal with the, with the problem of how do you show all that data on a small map um, We'll, we'll show you the data you need to see. So that's kind of the, um, the, the longer term direction of travel, I think. Um, kind of specifically for OS maps, there's a, kind of a, a few things I'll just share from, from what we're looking at for the, for the near future. Um, we're, we're changing the way we do difficulties for, for routes or, and activities. So in the past, I think, and, and, I, and I don't, I'd be really interested to hear kind of um, your, your thoughts on this. I think um, generally there's been a bit of confusion with um, with difficulty ratings for uh, for walks, um, not not just in OS maps but kind of across the board, um, where people kind of get a little bit confused whether it's referring to kind of the fitness required or the the level of experience required. So so we've really tried to kind of decouple those two things and say um, the activity 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 difficulties we're including in OS maps are technical ones. Um, and that's separate from the kind of fitness required. So um, an e as, as an example, you know, you could have a route that was easy from a technical point of view. It's, it might be walking along a concrete, a flat concrete path with no navigational difficulties. Um, but you could be doing that for 30 miles, in which case you need a, a decent degree of, of fitness. Uh, on the other side, you could have a, uh, you know, two mile walk that went up a grade three scramble. Now, obviously, um, from a fitness point of view, you might not need to be particularly fit, but um, from a level of experience and, and technical difficulty point of view, um, you don't want to recommend that to a first time walker. So that's why we're splitting the two and we're going to focus on um, the technical difficulty um, rating for, for the route. Um, and, then, and then the users can uh, infer the fitness required from you know, total distance, total ascent and that kind of thing. Uh, we're going to introduce some more activity types. So although most um, OS Maps users are, are generally walkers and hikers, um, we have quite a lot of cyclists as well, um, but we're going to be introducing things like horse riding, um, road cycling, uh, paddling. Uh, we're not going to try and sort of cover everything, but we're, we're covering the ones we get most, most requested, um, just to, um, to make sure OS Maps is as useful to as many different groups of, of people as possible. Uh, we're going to try and improve the, the route time estimates. So uh, at the moment we're using Naismith's rule, which um, kind of, again, has, has been around for, um, well, over 100 years now, um, and is, is great for if you're sort of trying to do a mental calculation when you're out on the hill, um, because it's quite simple and, and, and you can kind of apply it really easily. Um, but it's, it, it's not necessary to have such a simple rule when you're uh, in a digital product, you know, we, uh, even in, in your phone, the kind of the computing power is, is enormous. So um, we're looking at ways to refine that so we can give far better, more accurate route predictions um, and potentially even, you know, personalised ones. So um, it knows your, um, your fitness and, and your kind of uh, average speed at moving over different terrains. Um, you can predict accurately what, uh, what it's going to take you to, to, to do a particular route. Um, we're going to add activity recording. Um, so this allows people to um, keep a, a log really of where they've been. You know, there are lots of activity free rec activity recording apps uh, out there. So, you know, it's not something revolutionary. It's just um, adding the convenience of, of being able to uh, follow a route on, a, on OS maps whilst recording the activity. So, you know, if you deviate from it, um, you'll know where you went or um, you can get some information about your, your average speed and, and that kind of thing. Um, we're looking to improve our snap to path function. So I, I don't know how 
um, how much um, you guys have used those maps. But in, inside National Parks, we have a feature where if you're plotting the route, you can make it snap to the, the, uh, the, the public footpath. So if you are um, on a bike, for example, it will snap your route to bridleways, but it won't take you down the footpath. Um, and, it, and it just makes the whole process of creating a route a lot easier. But um, that stops at the National Park boundaries at the moment, which is um, a little bit frustrating for a lot of users. So we're exploring some ways to, um, to make that work wherever you are um, and, and hopefully make it a lot easier to create routes and earth maps um, wherever you are in the country. And, and finally, um, points of interest. So we are looking at ways to, uh, to include more um, points of interest data sets, particularly on the, uh, on the app side. So that, that's already available on, on the web. Um, but make it easier to use uh, on the app too. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, um, that's the end of the kind of the formal presentation bit, but um, I guess um, we've got uh, 20, 25 minutes-ish, um, and I'd be really keen to uh, answer any questions. Uh, I think if you've got um, ideas or feedback as well, um, I'd be really keen to kind of hear, hear from you, I think. There's, um, there's a huge amount of uh, you know, latent insight. Um, you guys have got you, um, you're out all the time. Um, you, you know what works and what doesn't. So um, if you want to share it now, that's great. If you don't, and you've, or you want to sort of mull it over a little bit, then um, I think um, they'll send out my email address to you guys um, after this. So um, you've got my, my contact information then, and I'd be more than happy to uh, either have an email exchange or pick up the phone and we can have a chat about some of these things. So. Um, so that you can share um, share any thoughts you have. But yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, Tim. Uh, yeah, very uh, lots of lots of interesting and insightful information there. Uh, so uh, I think we'll just give it a few moments for people to either type questions or obviously can unmute and uh, yeah, fire away. Hi, uh, this is Chris. I, I've got a, a question. Um, I, I really like OS, the app, because it's a slightly negative question. <laughs> okay, but I, I really think the app is brilliant, and certainly uh, it, it's kind of changed how I think in the mountains. In that, I, I've sort of uh, less when I'm playing, take a bit of paper. Uh, whereas, you know, historically, as you can tell, I'm a bit old. I always had a paper map with me. Um, the, the issue is that certainly with the newer version, it seems to be very internet heavy. And a lot of the places you go in the mountains in the UK have no internet. Is there any plans to make it so that it, it doesn't have to be so internet uh, reliant, shall we say? Um, yeah, so it, it should um, work offline. So with, with, with any of the, um, the maps, you can, you can download them to the device. Um, and then um, if you have no signal at all, they're stored on the device. Um, and, and can work. If, if that hasn't happened, and I, and I know there have been um, a few over the last maybe six months, a few updates which have, have made it um, <laughs> a little bit unreliable, those are all, that's all not planned. <laughs> so the, um, it, should, it should work 100% offline. Um, if there are any circumstances it's not, then um, feed it back and, and we'll make sure we investigate um, straight away because um, I think one of the, one of the development priorities over the last um, well probably year and a half now have been, has been stability. So we've been um, spending a huge amount of time making sure that it can be relied on um, wherever you are, internet or no internet. Um, so I think there, there are probably two aspects to it. There's um, the ensuring that you've got the stuff downloaded offline before you go, um, and if you've got any kind of feedback as to how we can make it. Clear. We've, I think there've been a number of changes over the years to sort of try and make it really clear um, when when something's downloaded offline. So there's a kind of yeah. usability aspect, and then there's a technical aspect. And, and for both of those, if there's something not quite right, then um, definitely yeah, drop drop me a message, um, and, and we'll look into it. Because the um, the app should work completely offline. So once you've got the um, the, the stuff downloaded, put it into flight mode is the, is the best way to check. So that's kind of what I'd always recommend. Um, once you've downloaded something pop it into flight mode and then there's the zero data going in or out and it kind of replicates um, being completely away from phone signal. Um, yeah, I, 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 I've, been, I've been playing with it and uh, I, I understand. What, what I've found, uh, there's a bit of feedback, uh, the paper maps that you download, hmm. that doesn't seem to, to work on my Android phone now unless I've got internet, whether I've downloaded the paper map 
yesterday or or six months ago. I have found a fix, and if you download uh, the the offline map, you know, so you download the map as well as the paper map because you download the route or you download just a few tiles, whatever they're called, that does still work. But the paper map seems to have stopped working if you, if you haven't got internet on on my Android phone anyway. Okay, well, yeah, if you could, if you could send over the information of the device, one of the, the tricky bits of Android is, um, unlike iOS, where there's like a, a, a dozen or so handsets available, there's, um, there's literally thousands of different Android devices. So we, we kind of, we check for the, um, you know, the, the, the 10 or so most common ones um, with every release. Um, but then sometimes there are strange quirks of, of devices. So yeah, drop, drop me an email with, you, with the details and we can... Um, Try and recreate that. But the other thing to mention is there's a um, so yeah, as as Chris mentioned, there are two ways of downloading offline maps. You can get an offline download for the paper maps. Um, you know, if you buy a paper map, you get a code that allows you to download it. Um, or if you subscribe, then you can sort of do a custom download for a route or a particular area. Um, we made some improvements to the um, paper one um, quite recently. So la last week, um, so it's it's version two point two. Um, which went out to improve the paper map um, downloading experience. So um, it may well be um, if you update to that one, then, you, then you'll find it um, working better. But we can um, chat over email. Okay, thank you. Okay, I shall make sure I have the latest thing and, and carry on playing. Thanks very much. Perfect. Cheers, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Um, there's a question in the chat, Tim, mm -hmm. that I can read out and unmute and explain it. <coughs> Is that from me? Um... Mountain yeah, bike. yeah, yeah, um, yeah, Tim. I uh, am a mountain biker, and at present, I use Memory Map because I can use my laptop, plan a route, and then download it to my GPS. Yeah, I find, I find it works really well. Uh, the trouble with Memory Map, of course, is the mapping is expensive, mm. but it also it's, well, it's American anyway, but it goes out of uh, date fairly quickly. So, I'd kind of like to, it's, it's a problem throughout mountain biking, I always think. So I'd like to be able to uh, subscribe to OS Maps, mm. but, but I kind of need a software product that I can, is useful if you and they can work on my laptop and plan routes. I just wondered, I've not come across an OS piece of software that does that just yet, and whether there is one. Good question. Yeah, so we, we don't have a, um, a so software in the same way as kind of memory map. It's a, a web-based service. So um, there's, there's obviously the OS Maps app, side of it um, but there is also a, a web version and, and generally actually the web version is what we'd recommend for for what you've described kind of in terms of planning routes um, so I guess on the plus side um, you don't need to download or install anything um, and it will work wherever and it, and it syncs um, so you know you, if you log in on one laptop you'll see all your routes those sync across to the mobile you could log in on another laptop and, and have the same experience um, obviously the one disadvantage is um, it doesn't work offline, so it, it's an internet. It requires an internet connection um, because you. It's basically a website. So, um, so if you, um, yeah, if you drop me your um, email or drop, yeah, drop me an email after after this, and I can send you over some information about the the web version of Earth Maps. Um, mm -hmm. but I think, yeah, that that's the um, the kind of route plotting solution we've got. It's it's kind of browser based rather than a uh, a software package you download to the, the computer. And is it quite is it quite elaborate as well? You know, can you sort of chop roots and you know chop them in half and reconnect and bits and pieces like that? So probably not quite as elaborate as that. I think what one of the the tricky things we try and kind of find the, the happy happy medium with right, is okay. uh, making it overly complicated um, and 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 including like every every possible kind of route manipulation tool we could, um, yeah. and obviously making it sort of so simple that it doesn't meet anyone's needs. And so. Right. What we, we, we're sort of aiming for um, mass market-ish. Um, I think there's, there's a, there are a number of sort of tools out there that um, can do you know a million and one things, but yeah. they're kind of complicated to get your head around. So we sort of try and try and keep it as um, as simple as possible. Which which yeah does mean sometimes there aren't um, all of the kind of uh, advanced tools maybe. But um, yeah, I, I can sort of set, I'll send you over a. Um, a free free subscription to have a play with and then um if you've got feedback on what would be really useful and, and why um then um we've obviously we've got a kind of roadmap of features we want to add um and so we're, we're always kind of keen to get insight on what will be useful 
That'd be great. We'll give that a go. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got another couple of questions um, on the chat. Uh, there's one from Simon. So again, I'll, I'll, Simon, you may want to ask this yourself. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, so I've been using the web-based and the app for, for a long time now. Um, but I noticed that when you buy a paper map and scratch the code off, if you want to redeem that, it's only done on the web. You can't do it on the app. Is it going to be a function to do it on the app soon? Um, we'd love to. Um, unfortunately, it's one of those um, things where, because the um, because Apple has quite a lot of control basically yes. over the the app store, um, they don't want to put that in, into the app because they kind of um, see it as treading on on their toes with, with the app store. Um, so we're not actually allowed. To, we, we we tried to originally, um, and, it, and it wasn't allowed. So um, there won't be a redeem um, function in app. Unfortunately, um, we are trying to make the redeem function on the website a little bit smoother. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we um, we can't add it to the app itself. Okay. All right. That answers that one. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Okay. I think Chris's comment kind of goes with Peter's. Chris, did you want to say something? My space bar didn't seem to do what it was supposed to. Yeah, I said you can, <laughs> you can uh, redeem paper maps on the Android version of the app. Yes. Quite easily. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, Android is a little bit more kind of uh, free. Really? That's what we can do. So, we, yeah, we added it there, but we, we haven't been able to run it on iOS. Yeah, oh, okay. Mm, cool. I, I can't actually see the comments list. So, if there are any other ones that, uh, need reading out then please do yeah um chris can i um sorry not chris oh, apologies tim um i was just thinking that you know in in our audience of uh, course providers course directors you know they will have hundreds of stories to share i mean uh, you know it sounds like for your um the get outside and potentially for the secret stories those you know i appreciate that app is is still developing be you know it sounds like that'd be a great match to for our you know providers to feed in uh, stories to inspire and share and promote mm. yeah no absolutely if you've got um any thoughts on things that you you'd like to contribute or want to just find out a little bit more then um do drop drop me a line after this and, and i can kind of put you in touch with the with the right people for that but um we're yeah we're always um really keen to get the um the best content we can um and you know so on os maps you, you can you can submit a route um just as a normal user and we've got um you know um a lot <laughs> you know sort of uh, a million routes there from um people who've, who've who've submitted their routes and said you know we'll share this with everyone um but i think the real the real value is the the kind of the premium routes we have the ones from trusted um trusted sources so um, if you want to sort of um, contribute to that um, and um, be, you know, feature routes in Earth Maps, for example, and and as sort of a part of that, we um, we we flag it as, you know, this is from someone uh, or or an organisation we trust. Um, here's a link back to their website if you want to find out more, or, or if you want kind of guiding on this route or whatever. So we're we're always looking to to in, in, include um, that kind of thing in, in the Earth Maps offering, um, and it just get, and it reaches a huge audience as well. So we we get. Um, you know, millions of people using our maps um, every year um, on the web and on, on the app side. So um, it's a great platform for, for that sort of content. So I'm not sure if there are any more questions that we have for uh, Tim this morning. So we'll just uh, give it a few, few more moments. Just while we're waiting, I guess, um, yeah, if you do have um, thoughts of, oh, I wish there was a solution which did this or um, you know, one of my biggest pain points mm. in digital navigation is is this. Then um, that sort of insight is is amazingly useful. So um, do um, do send it over. We're, uh, as I said, always kind of looking for uh, users and user feedback. Um, but I think particularly from, um, I guess, users like you guys who um, have a uh, a greater sense of insight into you know. Um, what, what's useful and, and kind of people who come into contact with a lot of other other people and sort of almost act as a funnels for that. So um, yeah, please don't hesitate to to pop me a message if you if you've got any thoughts like that. And who knows, maybe uh, you'll you'll have a feature named after you, <laughs> uh, not in the not too distant future on Earth Maps. 
I, I ask a, another question. You, you talked about the premium. Uh, you know, when you look at routes, you get the premium ones first and then have to untick it. Uh, so I, I half heard what you're saying. So how, how does that work? Who, who's deciding who's premium and who's not? Um, it doesn't seem like lots of routes that, you know, if you live somewhere, not the middle of Snowdonia, and you're looking for routes, you get hardly any until you untick the premium box. And then you get tons that are fine. Yeah. Um, no, so I think... Um, there's sort of two 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 answers to that. The first is um, we're kind of re-looking at our premium routes definition. I think it's going to become more of a sort of trusted route. So these are routes from organisations or, or individuals who um, f for um, for whom we, we can kind of say with confidence um, this route comes from this organisation or this person. Um, we know it's going to be a good one. It doesn't necessarily mean we've, we've gone out and walked it because, you know, we, there, are, there are thousands of, of, of potential routes from that. But um, it means, you know, so for example, we have routes from, from Country Walking and, and Trail Magazine. We, we know they're going to be uh, of good quality because um, they've, they have actually walked it and they have published it um, and they've put their brand against it, you know, so they're not going to, um, to add, add routes that are rubbish. So, so there'll be that bucket of, of trusted routes from, from people who who have their name against it, and um, we 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 trust that organisation or that that individual. Um, it will always be yeah um, by by definition as kind of a smaller subset of the total one. So um, that's why we have we have both. Um, you know we could take the approach that we don't want any user generated routes because some of them frankly aren't that great. Um, but it means we we miss out on a lot of, of good content. So. Um, in that sort of second batch of the, the non-premium, non non-trusted routes that have been submitted just by, by ordinary US Maps users. Um, at the moment, we've got a rating system, so um, you can give it you know, one to five stars, um, which, which sort of goes some way to help sort the, um, the, the good routes from the, the not, not so good. And, and so I think um, if, if you are using it and that there aren't premium routes in an area, um, uncheck check that premium route option, but maybe put it on four or five star and it, and it means you'll, you'll get the good ones. Um, in the future, we're going to be adding a little bit more um, information about routes. So you can add uh, reviews as well as ratings. So you can, you know, describe what's nice about a route and, um, and, and tag it and that kind of thing. So it will give, give you a little bit more um, confidence, I guess, in if you are using routes from a, from a non-trusted source, um, you can you can see which ones have been walked already and, and if they've got a good review um, and what people are saying about them so there's always gonna be both um yeah yeah uh i think that's a good idea but the, the star thing you can you can star your own route hmm. uh so which means then other people might go and walk it i suppose because otherwise they're not going to walk it because it's got no stars on it but that's almost like you know on TripAdvisor, you, you filling in a review for your hotel yeah, uh, so it kind of, uh, I, 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 I'm just, yeah, there's no solution for that one, but yeah, 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 okay. There isn't, I think, other than to say, um, once we've added reviews um, as well, mm. if you can see that, um, yeah, multiple other people have reviewed it, you, you know, it's not just the, um, the person who's created it giving it a good, good rating. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, there's always that tricky moment when a route's just been created um, and you, you can't really, you know, we don't want to stop the, the owner of that route from, from rating it. Um, and, I, and I think generally, um, if you have plotted a rubbish route, um, you're unlikely to go and rate, you know, some people just plot routes, you know, there are, I've looked through the, through the database, there are, there are a load and people have clearly, uh, you know, they've plotted just a, they've been out walking and they're like, oh, I wonder how long it will take me to get to this point. So they plotted a really basic route. It doesn't connect to useful points, it's not round. It's, it's lots of long straight lines, but they just wanted to get a rough feel for the distance left or whatever. Um, but then they've gone on and saved it and they've saved it as a public route, which is <laughs> quite annoying because um, it's not that useful to, to everyone else. So, um, Yeah, I, I'll sometimes plot a route not particularly accurately, purely because I want to download the route so I have the map on my phone. Sure, yeah. so, so the route is there, but I've not taken a great deal of time in making sure it's exactly on the footpaths and things like that. Yeah, because uh, that's my fix for the fact I can't get the paper maps to work. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. We've also done some work in um, using uh, machine learning to look at routes and, um, and understand. So it's never going to be perfect and it's not going to beat someone out walking the route itself. But um, you can actually learn a lot about a route just by um, analysing the data in included. Um, and so we're using that to help um, 
pro pro promote the ones that are likely to be good ones and, and sort of hide the ones that are likely to be to be not very good. So, um, you know, in the event of a new route coming along, which no one's yet had the chance to walk, um, we're able to to get a good gauge um, of it already just by um, applying some machine learning techniques to, to look at that route and uh, give it a, uh, an initial assessment. Interesting. Hmm. Mm, thank you, Chris. And that's an interesting subject because I would imagine that uh, all of you and all of the other providers up and down the country could contribute incredible routes, you know, and what better people to present routes to Ordnance Survey than the professionals. So, um, yeah, there's definitely scope there. I'd, I'd be really interested. I mean, if you want feedback and, and stuff like that or you know you want a user to be involved because i use it a lot for running mountain biking and for for work mm. uh, i'd be really <coughs> really enjoy sort of <laughs> giving you my opinion as you people probably noticed <laughs> no that'd be fantastic yeah thanks chris do just yeah drop me an email with your contact details and then i'll, I'll be in touch okay thank you uh well we um we're almost uh, at time, actually, so I'll just check. Are there any final questions before we wrap up today? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think that's it. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Tim, um, and huge thanks uh, to all of you here today. Um, as ever, please, please do send us in feedback. Um, this has been the final session of this lockdown series, which is say we really hope you have found helpful. Um, not sure whether we're going to do another series. That will depend on the review and the feedback that we get. It has we, we think it's worked uh, really well, and we're very uh, appreciative to all of the partners who have uh, helped to hopefully provide insight and information uh, for you. And um, yes, yeah, so on that note, I think I'll we'll say huge thanks again to Tim and Ordnance Survey. Uh, thanks again, everybody. And uh, do send us your feedback and we'll look forward to seeing you hopefully at some point in the future. Okay, uh, many thanks and take care. Happy Tuesday. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you.